פרופסור עודד ליפשיץ, from the Department of Archaeology and Ancient Near Eastern Cultures at Tel Aviv University, is inviting you to join him to a journey following those who composed the historical descriptions in the Hebrew Bible. The Untold Story of the Kingdom of Judah, Part E. The Untold Story about the Kingdom of Judah in the days of the Biblical Historiographers. Chapter 1. The Untold Story of the Hundred Years of Assyrian Rule in Judah. In this part of the podcast, we will deal with a century in history of the Kingdom of Judah between the days of King Ahaz, when Judah was enslaved to Assyria and became a vassal kingdom, and until the days of King Josiah, during which the Assyrian Empire retreated from all its strongholds west of the Euphrates. After a century, and in a quick and unexpected historical process, the Assyrian yoke suddenly disappeared, and Judah could raise its head, look back, and also look forward. This was the beginning of a new period, even if very short, of about 13 years, in which Judah could dream of a different world and a different future, and in light of this also, shape the past. This was a time when the historiographical description of the history of Judah and Israel was written. comprising the basis and core of what later developed into the array of books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. As already defined the introduction to this podcast, the biblical historiography describes the point of view of the Jerusalem elite, what it knew, what it wanted to tell, and what served its political, religious, and economic interests. The stories about ancient Jerusalem, which told the events that occurred hundreds of years before the time of their uh, authors, depended on the memories that the residents of Jerusalem had retained, memories rooted in the places, buildings, and objects that were in Jerusalem, shaped by the ways the historiographers sought to integrate these very memories into the descriptions of the ancient past, to serve their interests and historiographical intentions. In the descriptions of places far from Jerusalem and Judah, the authors were dependent on written and oral sources that reached them, as well as on their understanding and interpretation of these sources. Thus, they used them according to their own need and biases. The authors of the biblical stories seem to know what the sources they had from ancient times, so distant from their own, were telling them. But they didn't know what the written sources and ancient memories did not tell them. The untold story mostly, though not always, was comprised of what the writers didn't know. In contrast, When the biblical historiographers described something in the very near past, not long before the descriptions were written, and dealt with the contemporaneous issues of Jerusalem and its immediate surroundings, places that the authors and the target audience knew very well, then the untold story becomes especially interesting. For this time period, the authors had much better sources. But they also had memories that they and their readers were well acquainted with from personal knowledge. For this period, it is very more... For this time. For this time. Do you want to start from the beginning? What did you start with? The author of the biblical stories? What was it? Yes? The author of the biblical stories? <clears throat> the author of the biblical stories seems to know what the sources they had from ancient times, so distant from their own, were telling them. But they didn't know what the written sources and ancient memories did not tell them. The untold story mostly, though not always, was comprised of what the writers didn't know. In contrast, 
when the biblical historiographers described something in the very near past, not long before the descriptions were written, and dealt with contemporaneous issues in Jerusalem and its immediate surroundings, places that the authors and the target audience knew very well, then the untold story becomes especially interesting. For this time period, the authors had much better sources, but they also had memories that they and their readers were well acquainted with from personal knowledge. For this period, it is even more interesting to examine what the biblical authors didn't tell. In this case, what was left untold was information that they and their readers knew, perhaps even knew well. They didn't tell about what didn't fit the ideological line and their political and religious goals, or anything that wouldn't emphasize the centrality of Jerusalem in their story and the uncompromising line reinforcing their belief in the eternity of the house of David and the temple. The biblical authors knew a lot about events, people, and periods that they presented differently from reality, and the target audience that read their words also knew them well and knew many details about them. But the authors chose to describe them in a different way, subject to the interests and goals they had in the different periods in which the descriptions were written and the target audiences for whom they were composing. Every omission and every untold story conveyed a clear message to the target audience. The untold story included events, people, and places that the audience knew from their daily lives, which were omitted from the history written in their day and for them. The document that became the most important at the end of the first temple, which described history and explained the reality of life in that period of time, had simply ignored, erased, and deleted from history large parts of everyday reality, which didn't suit the interests of the authors. It is not just temples, palaces, empires that ruled in the land, mighty kings that ruled for many years, exciting events that were at the center of life, but also widespread and well-known customs that the text completely ignored. In my opinion, the erasure of all these in the description of the distant and recent history of the Kingdom of Judah and Israel was a part of the message that the writers wanted to convey to their contemporaries. A message that emphasizes what, of everything that existed around them, is significant and important and what should be ignored, forgotten, and not granted any importance, even though it exists and is present in the landscape and well known to all. In this part of the podcast, which deals with the untold story of the history of the Kingdom of Judah in the days of the biblical authors, we'll try to understand why the authors ignored the tight Assyrian rule of Judah from the time of the enslavement to Assyria in the days of King Ahaz in 732 BCE until the Assyrian withdrawal from the area in the days of Josiah about a century later. The meaning of the long years of enslavement to Assyria was also reshaped after the retreat and collapse of this empire, apparently during the few years of independence in the days of Josiah and at the time when the biblical descriptions were written. Thus, Judah was presented as an independent kingdom freed from the yoke of Assyria after Sennacherib's campaign in 701 BCE but it once again became enslaved, this time to Egypt, after Josiah's death in 609 BCE. The story was told this way because the authors sought to describe Josiah as a king who was not subject to foreign rulers. Although this framing does not at all reflect the reality of the long days of Menashe, 
which were the golden age of the years of Judah's restoration in the long period of the Assyrian peace, the Pax Assyriaca, during most of the 7th century BCE. As part of the ideological spin, the biblical authors completely ignored administrative centers and magnificent palaces that existed in great proximity to Jerusalem, stood out in the landscape, surrounding the city and were known to everyone who lived in or visited Jerusalem and its surroundings. I consider this omission to be evidence that these buildings were associated with the Assyrian presence and were part of the administration of the kingdom and the new economy that developed under the empire's rule. The authors also ignored ancient and important temples that existed in the vicinity of the city and operated at the same time as the temple in Jerusalem. In doing so, they conveyed a clear message to their readers about what is important and significant and true in the eyes of the Jerusalemite elite and about what is false, unimportant, and shouldn't be considered a significant part of the history of Judahite ideology of that period. The enslavement to Assyria, the obligation that accompanied it, the continuous Assyrian presence in Judah and in all the kingdoms of the region, and the imperial system which Judah was an integral part of, none of these are mentioned in the historiographical descriptions except for two specific events which the histor historiographers could not ignore. The enslavement to Assyria during the days of King Ahaz and Sennacherib's campaigns and the miraculous sparing of Jerusalem in the days of King Hezekiah. In other words, Assyria is not mentioned as part of a continuity in Judah's history, but as a single point in a long and eventful history. Its presence, its influence, and its meaning are essentially ignored. There is no doubt that everyone who lived in Judah during this period knew the significance of Assyria's presence in Judah during the hundred years of slavery understood the tremendous impact that the Assyrian presence had on the economy, administration, culture, religion, and government in Judah, and so all, the, all of this being omitted from the historical descriptions. They must have asked themselves the reason for this and understood the message of the biblical historiographers at a time when Assyria was no longer present in the region. National ideas prevailed in Judah. Criticism was expressed towards kings who were enslaved to foreign empires, while appreciation was expressed towards kings who rebelled and rejected the yoke. In terms of reconstructing the history of the days of Assyrian rule in Judah, the starting point is in the second half of the 8th century BCE, and especially during the reign of Tiglath III, who ruled between 745 and 727 BCE, the greatest of all the kings of Assyria. At that time, the Assyrian Empire established its rule in the entire region between the Iranian plateau in the east through the space between the Euphrates and the Tigris to Syria and the land of Israel in the west. The Assyrians conquered, destroyed, and annexed most of the kingdoms in the region and organized them into provinces. Starting with the reign of Sargon II, who ruled between 720 and 705 BCE, the process of annexation was accompanied by two-way deportations, whereby large populations from among the conquered kingdoms were exiled to region at the other end of the empire and scattered there, replaced with other populations, groups brought from different places across the empire and settled into the newly vacated empty areas. As described in, pre in the previous chapters, the Kingdom of Israel was just one of many kingdoms that were conquered and destroyed as part of the process of Assyria's takeover of the entire region and as part of the establishing the arrangements within it. 
The territory of the king of Israel was annexed to a Syrian empire. A large population was exiled from it and replaced by exiles brought in from around the empire and three provinces were established in the territory of the kingdom. A few small kingdoms that were on the margins of the empire managed to survive the days of Assyrian rule as semi-independent kingdoms. The kingdom of Judah, the Transjordanian kingdoms Ammon, Moab, and Edom, and the coastal kingdoms in the Philistian region and Phoenicia. The Assyrians avoided annexing them for various reasons. They were small kingdoms with little military power, whose economic benefit is very low. I'm talking about Transjordanian kingdoms and Judah. Kingdoms with maritime capabilities that the Assyrians wanted to exploit the kingdom on the coast of Phoenicia, or kingdoms located on the way to Egypt and thus economically and strategically important, and these are the cities in Philistia. These kingdoms were enslaved to Assyria and continued to exist as vassal kingdoms, whose local ruler was subordinated to the Assyrian Empire without abolishing the mechanism of local government, government or the political, economic, and administrative framework of the enslaved kingdom. The enslaved king, dependent on Assyria for foreign policy, had to assist the empire whenever needed and raise an annual tribute according to the rates that were set for him. Throughout its existence, Judea, Judah was a small kingdom that operated on the margins of the large, powerful, rich kingdoms. Throughout its existence, Judah was a small kingdom that operated on the margins of the large, powerful, rich kingdoms. Most of the kingdom's territories are within the hill country or the desert fringe, the Beersheba, Arad, Jordan valleys, and the Dead Sea area. No major international roads passed through the Judah, and it had no access to the sea. The kingdom's economy was based mainly on agriculture, which was concentrated in the low and fertile lowlands, and Judah's marginal political, military, and economic position dictated the kings of the House of David a conciliatory and adaptive policy. Throughout the long history of the kingdom, most of the kings of Judah surrendered to strong local kingdoms and to the armies of the local and international empires and avoided military struggle that could have endangered the kingdom's existence. As will be discussed below, Ahaz, the son of Yotam, who reigned in Judah with the expansion of the Assyrian empire in the region of Syria and the land of Israel, continued the policy outlined by his ancestors. When Assyria appeared and established itself in the region of the land of Israel, he preferred to submit to it and avoided forming an alliance with the kings of Israel and Aram, who rebelled against it. And we spoke about it, and we can read about it in the second book of Kings, chapter 16, verses 5 to 9. With this act, he saved Judah from the bitter fate of the kingdom of Israel, which was destroyed and annexed to Assyria in 722 to 720 BCE. Judah continued to exist as an Assyrian vassal kingdom throughout the reign of Ahaz and during the early reign of his son Hezekiah. The first retreat from the traditional submission policy of the Judahite kings which proved itself in the longevity of the kingdom and the royal house that headed it, occurred in 705 BCE. In this year, Sargon II was surprised in a battle in southeastern Anatolia. His army was defeated, he was killed in battle, and his body wasn't even brought to burial. This defeat was interpreted as a sign of the weakness of the Assyrian Empire. Revolts broke out all over the empire, including in its western part. Judah, the Transjordanian kingdoms, and the coastal cities of Philistia and Phoenicia rebelled against Assyria as well. Hezekiah himself may have been even one of the leaders of the rebellion. In 701 BC, the new Assyrian king Sennacherib, son of Sargon, arrived in the region accompanied by a large army. Most of the rebel kings preferred to surrender 
In contrast, Hezekiah, king of Judah, was among the few kings who stood firm and didn't surrender to the king of Assyria. Sennacherib's reaction was harsh. He destroyed most of the territory of the rebellious kingdom and besieged Jerusalem. Hezekiah surrendered and saved Jerusalem from destruction, but it was the greatest crisis in the history of the kingdom. The entire lowland region, which was the richest and most important region in the agricultural economy of Judah, was destroyed. Likewise, the valley of Beersheba in Arad were destroyed and there was considerable depopulation in the hill country, especially in its southern part. Large areas of the lowlands were turned away from Judah. Most of them were handed over to the administration and rule of the kingdom of Ekron, and Sennacherib imposed on Judah high tribute. Decades passed until Judah recovered from the destruction that Sennacherib inflicted upon it, and even after many decades, the kingdom was unable to restore the economic and settlement power it had before the rebellion against Assyria. Sennacherib's policy shows Assyria's imperial interests. It seems that Assyria had no interest in abolishing the existing kingdoms and annexing them to the empire since the economic utility was low. And in these regions, there is a constant fear of the infiltration of nomads and the under undermining of the central government. Therefore, Sennacherib was content to weaken these kingdoms in a way that would prevent them from renewing the rebellion in the future, but he left the local government intact. Judah's enslavement to Assyria, which also included an annual tribute to the empire and the provision of heavy labor whenever it was demanded by the empire, continued throughout most of the 7th century BCE during the reign of King Menashe and his son Ammon, as well as in the beginning of the reign of King Josiah. In this period, Assyria reached the peak of its power, when Sennacherib's successors, Esarchadon, who ruled between 681 to 669 BCE, and Ashurbanipal, who ruled between 669 and 631 BCE, managed to establish a royal dynasty in Egypt as well, the 626 Said dynasty, and to base Assyria as the only empire in the ancient Near East. Researchers refer to this era as the Assyrian peace, the Pax Assyriaca. Throughout this period, the Assyrians tried to unify all parts of the empire into one economic and political unit. Judah was a small part of the mighty Assyrian system, a small vassal kingdom at the southwestern end of the empire. Its economy was integrated into the imperial system, and the Assyrian closely monitored the conduct of the kingdom and assured its loyalty. This broad picture is completely ignored in biblical historiography, even though it was well known to everyone who lived in Judah at the time. The message of this disregard is clear to anyone who reads the biblical descriptions and knows the policy that prevailed among the Jerusalem elite in the days of Josiah. After Assyria had already withdrawn from the area and no other leadership had yet established itself with the same strength. During this gap period, it was possible to strive for liberation and prosperity, to ignore the great powers that were in the region and hope that the glorious days of the united monarchy would soon return. In the next chapter, we will examine the enslavement of Judah to Assyria during the days of Ahaz. We'll discuss the background to the enslavement, its conditions, the impact it had on the kingdom's economy and the developing administration and the way things were described in biblical historiography. We will consider what the biblical historiographers knew about the days of Ahaz, 
which part of it they chose to tell and which parts were left untold. This will be the window through which to examine the changes that took place in the kingdom during this period, which can be confirmed from the archaeological research. The main target is to explore why the historiographers ignored all these developments in their descriptions of the history of the kingdom during this period of time. See you in the next chapter. 